another edition of Fired Up, our first program of 2022. Uh, we have an exciting program planned for you today, but before we get started, I just wanna quickly mention that we have a great trip coming up with the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass going to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I will have uh, committee co-chair Howard Cohen put a link to our website in the chat so you can get some more information about our organization as well as that upcoming collector's tour. All right, so today we have Jose Chartier, an incredible artist and just such a generous educator in person. I am really excited to have him with us today and to share a little bit about his life history as well as his incredible artwork. Uh, so Jose, if you'd like to go ahead and hit screen share, the green button, uh, we can go ahead and get your presentation started. Okay, how's that? Perfect, go ahead. All righty. Okay, so I was born in Havana, Cuba and uh, lived there till I was four. And my family um, immigrated uh, to the United States um, about a year after Castro came to power. And these these are my siblings in, in our front yard with some of uh, um, you know the uh, gorillas. Um, so you know in Cuba, as, as some of you might know, I mean there was a period where um, you know we didn't know. My parents didn't know that. That Castro was going to go, you know, you know, kind of ally himself with the Soviet Union and, you know, turn Cuba into a communist country. And once they, you know, a lot of their friends got out um, before um, things really got kind of, you know, uh, shut down there as far as people coming and going. Um, and, but we, my parents waited for whatever reason, they were hoping things were gonna turn around, but they didn't. So we immigrated, uh, this is a long story, really short, but um, uh, we immigrated uh, to the States. And this is my, um, part of my family here, uh, landing at uh, Idlewild uh, Airport, which is now Kennedy Airport. And um, so this would have been in 1960 and, um, Anyway, so we, we ended up settling in the Northeast and um, my father got a teaching job uh, at Yale University. He, he had been trained as um, an attorney, but he never practiced law. He um, um, immediately started teaching um, at the University of Havana. And um, so, um, I was, you know, educated in Connecticut, so I grew up there and uh, went to a small state school, Southern Connecticut State University, and um, um, it had a really small kind of rudimentary glass studio, but that's where I started and uh, fell in love with the material. Uh, comes, you know, subsequently went to uh, graduate school at Kent State and studied with Henry Hallam, which was a, a great experience for me. Um, Henry was a, a great teacher and continues to be. He's retired now, but um, and the, this is a series which I've been doing for many years. I call the uh, Still Life series, and um, I, I make the elements um on top of the base first and then i um i cast um the base and i take uh, plaster forms off of the elements and press them into the glass uh this one is slightly different the base is kiln cast so it's a slightly different process but it it shows um kind of an interest i've had for a while uh, with combining um, glass and metal and uh, usually copper. Um, and so I do quite a bit of electroplating or have in the past and, and still have a, a plating set up in my studio. Um, so this is kind of the continuation of this series. 
and it's kind of evolved over the years, but I, I always go back to it. I love working with this series. Um, oftentimes the elements on top are very figurative, like in this case, and um, I play around with, um, with gesture. And um, this piece is at Ken Saunders Gallery in Chicago, more recent one. And this is actually, uh, yeah, one of two very recent pieces. Um, and it shows like on some of the other ones did that I have these forms that float in the base. Um, I was, um, my first experience with sand casting was with Bertil Valley. I uh, was uh, a TA, a teaching assistant at Pilchuck with him a couple of times and um, really became intrigued with uh, encasing forms in solid glass. Um, and I also had an, one of the early residencies at the Creative Glass Center of, of America at Wheaton Village. And um, uh, in, in that area in South Jersey where Wheaton is, of course, if Paul Stankard lives lives there and, and was one of the people that founded that fellowship program. Um, and so we would spend a lot of time with Paul. Paul would come to Eaton Village or we would go to his place. And um, so you know that's a real mecca for paperweight making, South Jersey. And of course, Paul being the premier um, paperweight maker in the world, um, that kind of triggered this interest in doing that. Um, and some of my early pieces were all about pieces being encased. There weren't any elements that were coming off the top of the, of the cast form. And this is my former assistant, Kyle Cusan, and this is the studio that I had in, in Rhode Island, right outside of Providence for 14 years before moving here. And Kyle um, was my assistant for a period of time. Um, incredible really talented artist in his own right. And this is us making the forms that go into the bases. And so we're getting ready to cast. That's the element uh, right there. And it's just, it has a torch on it, which is keeping the punty warm. And we're kind of getting ready to, uh, to cast that. And we're keeping that form, which I made ahead of time, um, keeping it warm and it's gonna go into the casting. And this is what the, the, the uh, mold looks like. And it's made out of sand and bentonite. And it's really a, a crude way of, of casting, but it, but it works for me. And so what I did was I packed in a styrofoam form into the, uh, into the sand. And then I, into that cavity, I ladled molten glass. And then I take that inclusion that was hanging up and I, I submerge it in, into the glass. And I break it off and there it is floating in the mold. And then I cover the top of the mold with um, essentially Kugler powders. It's a you know, finely ground um, uh, glass color, uh, the consistency of talcum powder. So I sift that on and then we melt that into the surface. And you can see over to the, to the side here, I have kind of a map of where I'm gonna press the elements. Am I going too fast? <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so, so here I am and I'm pressing these plaster forms. So what I do is I, I make those blown or solid hot worked elements first, and then I take a plaster uh, mold off of the bottom. So that it's actually plaster and silica flour. And I press that into the, um, into the glass. And we just spot heat every area where I'm gonna press a plaster form. And you can see in this case, I have all three of them in there and I slowly kind of uh, press them into the glass. And that's what it looks like before it goes into the annealing oven. 
And, you know, sometimes I'll wait 20 minutes, half an hour to let this these cool down before um, I put them in the annealing oven. And I, as I mentioned, I've, I've combined um, over the years metal with, with glass. This is gold um, on the outside. But what I do is in my studio, I can, I can plate uh, copper. And then when I was making this series where I was really, these were about being really uh, glitzy, um, I would use silver and sometimes gold. Um, and these were clear forms initially. Um, so when I make them, when I do the hot work, they're completely clear blanks. And, um, and then I add the color uh, later. Um, this is the back side of that piece. There's a silver one. And I would trap bubbles, which add kind of to the optical effect. And I had been seeing, I was living, as I said, in Providence, and I would go um, to the uh, museum in, in Boston, the Museum of Fine Arts, where they had an incredible silver um, collection of uh, Paul Revere silver, really, really nice early American silver which has a kind of a softness to it that I, that I really was attracted to. And that really inspired me um, to pursue uh, this series. And, you know, kind of ridiculously time consuming, but I, but I enjoyed working them, making these pieces. And this is one that's just copper. I left it copper on the outside. Um, so the color on the inside, well, actually, it'll, I think it'll be easier. To, it's actually on the back of the metal. Um, and those are um, porcelain enamels that I airbrush on. There's a detail of that bubble. And so this, that series kind of evolved and I ended up plating, I was plating everything for a period of time there. I really uh, liked, um, you know, the, the combination of those two materials. Um, and they kind of, you know, uh, I wouldn't say culminated, but, but, but um, I you know, kind of finally with this series started making these um, uh, vitrine pieces. Um, and um, so they were, I, I, I ended up collaborating with a woodworker who made the wooden tables and a metalsmith that helped me with the, um, these vitrines, which were really pretty elaborate. Um, and, um, and these were lit from underneath. So the table had, had lighting in it. And it was, it was a great project, challenging, but I really uh, was happy with the results. And I felt like I really wanted to control how pieces were viewed in galleries or wherever and people's homes. And so this really controlled everything. Um, you know, that the, these forms were enclosed in the vitrine and then they sat at a certain height on the tables. And so I was controlling how they were, how they would be viewed. And I, I, I enjoyed that. And if I can interject for a moment, Jose, um, we have some questions regarding the dimensions of the teapots. How tall are those works? They're about um, 16, you know, 17 inches tall, something like that. They vary in height, okay. but, but maybe like 12 inches to about 16 inches. All right. And um, could you tell us a little bit about the meaning or what is pulling you towards those forms? Uh, the teapots in particular. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, for me, one of the constants in, in my work is kind of looking into uh, the material. So, you know, I mean, glass is kind of, uh, you know, perfect, of course, for that. So, um, and I think, it's partially, you know, I, I've also, I come out of a crafts background in a sense. Um, 
I'm not entirely because I, I, I went to, I mean, I went to a, a, a state university, but I studied art. And even before that, um, you know, I've always been interested in art. So, but nonetheless, glass is a material where at least when I was coming up in it, you really kind of learned, you know, it, it really was kind of a crafts, more of a crafts material. At that point. So I've always been really interested in, in vessel forms, but also kind of looking within forms. And um, for me, that's about kind of um, looking into, not getting too deep here, but um, uh, kind of thinking about looking inwardly as a person and thinking about soul and those sorts of things. And really, I think it's, it's, it's a constant in my, um, in my work and, and the different series that I've done. I hope that, that uh, answers the question. Yeah, and just to follow up for a moment, um, mm -hmm. someone was also curious with pieces like the still lives, um, where you're often working with three major elements on the base. Is there something that um, is informing that choice of using the three components yeah. or? Yeah, um, you know, really it, it, it's kind of a design, you know, choice, um, but, um, and it, it just, you know, yeah, I would say most of the time there are three elements on there and it's just classic kind of design. I mean, kind of like the Madonna and child, you know, triangle. Um, and um, um, so it's, it doesn't have any real kind of uh, um, meaning beyond that to me, you know. All right, great. Thank you. And then more recently, you know, I've done a couple of these, and I've always had an interest in, in working um, architecturally with these pieces. And these are really quite small. Um, and um, maybe these were done in the last couple of years. And they might be, you know, six inches tall, something like that. Um, the only one that's not plain. I heard someone. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll just uh, fix that, Jose. Please proceed. Fix what? Okay. Someone may be unmuted. I'll fix it, but you can go ahead and proceed. Can I get rid of that toolbar along the top there? The uh, I know you are screen sharing that one. That eh, doesn't matter. Um, okay, so. So this is the process of, um, of you know, the, the, for most of the pieces that I do plating on. And it's, so I start with drawings and then I, um, I cold work the uh, form that's gonna be sandblasted and eventually plated. So that piece has stencil on it. And you can see along the side here, a strip of uh, stenciling material where I've cut out little circles and, um, so it's, it's, it's a, uh, time, it's a laborious kind of project, but, um, I enjoy that kind of work, I guess. Uh, and so this is uh, a piece in a spray booth and I'm airbrushing that color that you see that's on the inside of the metal. And then I spray a conductive coating because glass doesn't conduct electricity. And, um, and, and I, I start peeling off eventually parts of the stencil, and that's what's going on over here. These are stencil material that I that I've peeled away. And what I do is on the conductive coating, in this case copper, um, and so the, it's airbrushed on also. And um, this is a lot of process that I'm talking about. I hope it's not too much, <laughs> but. Um, um, so this has the copper coating on it, and it's got telephone wires that run down um, and attach um, to the copper. And they just have to be making ever so slight amount of contact onto the copper. Um, and then that goes into the bath. So this armature, um, the piece and the armature go into the plating bath. And this is um, 
for lack of a better term, a missile piece that I was uh, doing some plating on it. And this is what the plating bath looks like. And you can see the telephone wire right here. Um, and um, so the plating happens over days. I plate very slowly. And I was just doing a detail here. There were two of these bands around this missile piece. Um, and that's what it looks like when it's plated. Um, so it had wire wrapped around it. And then these were plastic uh, screw heads that I uh, kind of countersunk. So it's kind of an illusion that it's, that it's bolted together. Um, and that's what the piece um, eventually was a pretty large piece for me. So, you know, a, a cast base and the, the top section was blown in three sections glued together and then I plated over the glue joints. And that's Baxter, no longer with us, unfortunately. But, uh, and this is my studio, which is downstairs. Um, I live uh, essentially on the side of a mountain and um, um, we my wife and I live in a, in a cabin and the footprint of the cabin, which is really wonderful for me is, is my cold working studio. So it's like a large two car garage, but it has um, glass block on two sides. And, um, you know, I've got most, uh, most of the cold working equipment that I need. Um, and I've always blown pieces. I, you know, I enjoy working with blown glass and um, I've done a series um, which I'm going to go back to working on soon, which have these copper wire drawings on them, which I make ahead of time and then pick up. Um, and these are range in size from, uh, you know, 15 inches and they'll go up to 20 some odd inches. And, and I really think of these, but nor, when they come out of the annealer, you, can, you can't really see the copper drawings because I bury them uh, with glass, uh, colored glass powders. So to me, they're kind of like archaeology, I feel. They're, I feel like I'm unearthing these drawings, uh, which I do by sandblasting um, to expose them. And then I, um, I sandblast them and then I, um, acid etch them. And sometimes I'll patina the copper afterwards too. And this led uh, in the last year or so to this wall piece, which was the same process, um, except that um, I opened the vessels into flat sheets. Um, and I would, I would drill holes into the molten glass so that I could mount them to the wall uh, eventually. It's a detail of the copper. And I love working with copper. It's, it's um, a material that's, that's, you know, it's soft. It's somewhat compatible with the glass. You have to be careful. I have figured out ways of making it work, um, which I'm happy to talk about if anybody's interesting. Um, and by work, I mean that it's, you know, not cracking the glass. And these, so they are freestanding kind of drawings. Um, and I, I fuse the copper wire with a torch together. Um, they're not soldered per se. I'm just melting the copper to itself um, and working with different, different uh, gauge copper wire. And so now this is at the, I teach at a local, well, for the last year and a half, I've taught at a um, boarding school in Carbondale, the town that I live in. And, um, and before that, for a number of months, I was rebuilding the glass studio. Um, and so this is actually, I was working there before I took it over. And this is uh, me applying the drawing. So I use a torch, you can kind of see the torch off to the left here, and just kind of gently heat up the wire so it's glowing. And then I uh, press it on to the glass. Um, with a, with a tag layout. And this is the continuation of that piece. I've opened up the bottom end of, 
of the vessel here, the, and I'm going to punty it there. And then what I do is after I anneal them, so I open them up in the cylinders, you can kind of see the holes that I've, that I've drilled in it. Um, I cut out a section of it, and then I, um, I pick them up. I, I heat them up in, in an oven and pick them up on kiln shelf and introduce them into the glory hole. And eventually I, I get them to about this point. This piece is done. Um, the copper drawing is on the bottom side at this point. But the reason I do it that way is because I want, I want the undulations in the glass. If I just opened it up in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a kiln, I wouldn't get the same kind of uh, soft look uh, that, that this has. And um, recently, back in October, I did a residency um, at um, the Tacoma Museum of Glass at MOG. And so when I was thinking about what to do with this residency, because it was, it was five days and um, of actually, you know, working in the hot shop there, which was an incredible opportunity. And so I was trying to, to think of what I was going to do and what, and, and I've worked with teams of glass blowers before uh, quite a few times. And uh, I enjoy that. It's very different. I mean, it kind of removes you a little bit from the process, but you're not touching the glass, although I do sometimes, but um, uh, you still are so involved in the process anyways. Um, and so I thought I, would, I had a number of years ago done a series which was influenced by these pieces that I saw in this Christie's catalog. And this piece in particular, which was a, a, um, a, a, a tea bowl, it's actually two, uh, two forms stacked on each other. But these are very small. They're maybe four and a half inches wide by about the same four and a half inches tall. But they're two separate forms, the bowl on the bottom and then the, the form on top. And I was just really taken by this. Um, uh, by this form. And then I ended up seeing one at the Metropolitan uh, Museum in New York. Um, and so I actually saw one in person. And so they're Northern Song Dynasty, 11th, 12th century. Um, and um, yeah, I, I was just completely taken by the forms and just kind of how minimal they were, and just perfectly beautiful. <laughs> Uh, and simply view. And so that's what I, I decided to kind of use those pieces as a starting point. And when I went to Tacoma, and, and this is kind of what transpired, I, I thought, well, you know, I knew I wanted to make them a lot bigger than four and a half inches. So, and I thought this was the opportunity to do it. And this, the team, um, Ben Cobb, Sarah, and Gabe um, were incredible. And this was uh, just a really productive five days. So this is the team working on these pieces and that's an interior form. So I really started kind of changing the forms um, and, and the scale. I mean, we're really working large, which was incredible. I mean, this glory hole, which is not even the biggest one there, it's just hard to believe, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, the equipment was amazing. The team was great. And so this is another interior form. Um, and I, most of them had cane on them. And this shows you the cane and also that the foot of those bowls was hollow. It wasn't an applied foot. And these were, you know, this is a drawing that I did before going to Tacoma in kind of preparation for that experience. And it shows how these pieces fit together. If they, you'd be able to see this if they were tra completely transparent. Um, and they come apart, so they're not permanently mounted together. And these, this series kind of um, started evolving out of that. And we started putting them together as we were going. And uh, Walt Lieberman, who was you know, giving uh, the commentary on what was going on, also does these great drawings on the floor. 
um, of the studio there. And this is the pieces being cold worked in the cold working studio. And so you kind of get a sense of the scale of, of this piece. I ended up not using this interior form. We did another one and you'll see in a second, this one. So this was kind of the finished pieces. And um, so I have a couple shots, a couple views to show of each of the pieces. There were eight of them. Um, and um, yeah, to kind of show you, um, you know, the different, the shapes of them. And this is the one that's most like that original inspirational little ceramic uh, um, tea, tea bowl. This is kind of one of the smaller ones. And so it's kind of, it's, although I've worked on this, it's really quite different from what I normally do, but I, um, uh, I'm really happy with the way this series has come out. And, you know, it's hard to get a sense of scale, but these are, these are actually pretty large pieces. Someone is asking Jose about the weight distribution on these pieces and um, the stability. Do they get top heavy at all with the additional components sitting on top or? Heavy? No, because most of the weight is at the bottom. Oh, not, I don't know that I have anything that shows that. Um, what we, maybe in some of the process shots, but um, there's actually, a, there, there's, um, um a form that we apply to the to the bottom uh, that goes into the foot um so that was put on hot and it's a big um like solid cylinder of glass um so that in addition to the weight on the bottom of the this bulbous part really makes them pretty stable um yeah i was concerned about that initially but as we were going and as we get them out of the annealer we were able to kind of check that out and see you know what would be the best way to proceed and um and these most of these are pretty light on top so the weight is down low so they're pretty stable yeah and with the cane work that you're doing and and the color variation are the reflections intended in the series or a happy accident the reflections um on the there uh, were yeah some earlier shots that you uh showed us that had some reflections from the color that yeah, some i mean oh another thing i want to say is these are not these were taken by my phone <laughs> i've not had these professionally photographed yet so this was just sitting in the gallery and these are all at um raven gallery in aspen now um and um uh, so, you know, it was gallery lights were on it, which we didn't really adjust. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just a way of kind of, um, uh, you know, recording these pieces okay. in, initially. Um, so I'm going to have them photographed professionally now, and I apologize for that, for all these reflections. But um, not that I mind. I mean, I mean, that's another thing is that, you know, a lot of the work that I do um is not shiny i um, mean other than uh selective you know parts of the cat of the uh still life series and, and of course the 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 um the teapots you know are, are have a lot of reflection but you know 90 percent of what i've done um was was not shiny glass and this was one instance where i said um that i didn't want to do that I didn't want to sand, you know, kind of acid etch these, sandblast them and acid etch them. Um, and um, so, so yeah, so it's going to be a whole different uh, experience having these photographed, I, I think. And you can even see, I mean, it's got some little blue tape there <laughs> that let me know, um, you know, how to, because they had just come out of, um being on pallets and 
big boxes and you know I was taking them out and putting them together but the gal that did the cold work in Tacoma Kristen uh, who's incredible um did a fantastic job on these um she would mark them with that blue tape um to let me know like um and it would coincide with a piece of tape on the inside of the bowl i you know uh subsequently i've um which i do with most of my pieces i've keyed them uh so you know how to put them together and which way they should go um so yeah that's the last one. I think. No, there's one more. This one. This is the kind of the most minimal one, but I like it a lot. Uh, I mean, I like the fact that it's not quite so. It's just the, the, there is cane and whatnot on it, but it's much more subdued. And that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Jose. <laughs> we do have a couple more questions I'd like to get to now that you've finished. Um, there's definitely a strong architectural influence in your work that uh, people appreciate, and particularly going back to the pieces that you showed us after the teapots. Um, you had some plated pieces there, and someone was wondering if you are drafting um, the drawings for, for creating those. Yeah, for the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, drafting in the sense that um i mean i'm not sure exactly what you mean by drafting i think uh, they're wondering how technical you're getting with regard to the precision of those drawings they're pretty they're definitely very technical so yeah they're 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 drafted i see i see what you mean um yeah um they are they are drafted and so i take a lot of measurements um you know off of the off of the, the blank, the, you know, the clear glass form. And so it's very measured and exact. And that makes it a lot easier in the long run. Um, and then with the teapots, I use calipers and um, will kind of open up, you know, uh, you know, the flatten out the teapots basically uh, in, into a two dimensional drawing so I can measure where things are. Um, I, you know, with the teapots, I allow more kind of freehand stuff to happen. And, and I like that a lot. Um, and um, my Kyle Cusan, my uh, former assistant in Rhode Island, was really had gotten interested in um, pinstriping um, and had a real influence on me um, in, in those teapots. I mean, if you look at if you look at some of the forms on them or the drawings on them, it's 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 really all about pinstriping. Um, so he got, he had gotten into this, and then me <laughs> subsequently um, this culture from like the fifties and uh, you know sixties uh, um, kind of hot rod culture. Um, you wouldn't know this unless you know I would tell you about it, but. Um, and so that was, you, you never know what's going to kind of influence your work, but uh, that was an influence on me for sure. And in terms of the enamels that you're using on the teapots, are mm -hmm. you firing those on before the electroforming? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're porcelain enamels. Uh, so they're, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of the brand name of them now, PBO, PBO. And they're, readily available you can get them through like dick blick or any of those um utrecht you know art supply places online and they um they're water soluble and they fire at about 300 degrees so it's it's really nice because you don't have to um i don't re anneal the pieces or anything like that um it's low enough that it doesn't really create a problem um and they were a fantastic uh, discovery and a lot of times i'll mix in uh metal flake um again you know kind of car culture uh not car culture i hate that but hot rod <laughs> culture um you know kind of 
painting techniques where you're mixing these, these paints up and adding metal flake to them. Um, and those, so those colors just like explode when you put light on them. Um, so it, they're, they're wonderful in combination with glass. Um, are, yeah. So that's you have, it. you know, such a, an extensive vocabulary when it comes to the different techniques that you're using mm -hmm. um, to create your work, some being much more immediate than others. Is there something in particular that's guiding that, that choice? Um, as far as what process I use? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes I'll just, you know, um, I'll get an idea of something that I want to make and it just requires kind of figuring out a process. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to deny that I like process, but it also kind of drives me crazy sometimes, you know, and, um, and so over the years I, you know, I've had, I, I make it sound like I'm so old, um, but I will, um, I've had, you know, assistants that really helped me out a lot with these more kind of, a uh, time consuming uh, processes. Um, but um, yeah, it just it just depends on on what I need to learn to get what I'm after. And plating, I was just um, it started, I was teaching at the University of Illinois, and there was a really basic old plating set up there, which was pretty rough. And um, uh, and I started kind of experimenting and, and uh, uh, kind of taught myself to a certain point. Uh, but I, you know, I, I knew what I wanted and I knew that I was going to have to really learn how to plate. So I figured out and plate well, because it's easy just to build up copper on something, but to get it to be smooth and, and shiny, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a different thing. Um, and uh, so I actually became, you know, you know, I figured, well, let me talk to Michael Glancy, who was like the master of plating. And he we became really good friends and, and initially long distance on the phone. He was in uh, Massachusetts and I just outside of uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And I was in Illinois. And uh, so for a long time, I only knew him from phone conversations. And then I ended up moving to Providence. And uh, we would work together. I would visit his studio. He would come by mine. And um, he taught me a lot about, about copper plating. Um, so, well, yeah. yeah. The one thing that I immediately noticed with your work is just how incredibly refined the plating is. You know, I'm used to seeing it much thicker, more built up. And um, yeah. I can imagine that is pretty painstaking. It is, it is. But once you, you know, like anything, once you get it, you know, you, you figure it out, you get it dialed in, um, you know, it goes much more smoothly. Um, but um, I'm plating a lot less these days for whatever reason. Um, but anyways. So will you be continuing the series that you started in your residency or was that just sort of a one time limited? No, I'm going to continue it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, and I'm going to do it probably smaller scale uh, on my own. Um, but um, I no, I plan on continuing it. Yeah, I, I really have enjoyed it. And um, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now, but you and everyone can stay on and chat freely if people have more questions. Um, but just wanted to formally thank you so much, Jose, for being with us. You're oh, just thank you. incredibly generous with your knowledge. And of course, your artistry is phenomenal. So we thank really, you. really appreciate having you here today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Dimitra. Of course. Thank you so much.